Well, good morning. Thank you for being with us, and thank you uh, to Mr. Kennedy and your, for your leadership and for Raytheon for uh, sponsoring this forum again this year. My name is Karen Young. I'm a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute, <coughs> and it's my pleasure to start our first panel of the day, which is Economic Inclusion Builds Regional Security. Um, I'm very lucky to have three uh, I think excellent speakers to this topic with different sorts of expertise and background. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce them, but you'll find also fuller bios uh, in your notebooks. Um, first, we have Dr. Nasser Saidi, who is the founder and president of Nasser Saidi Associates. But he's best known, I think, recently for his work in Dubai as chief economist in the DIFC. Um, he also has been really instrumental as executive director formerly of the Hakama um, Institute for Corporate Governance. And many of you might also know his work as he was Minister of Economy and Trade and also Minister of Ind Industry in Lebanon and served as Deputy Governor of its Central Bank. Um, then we'll have Dr. Um, Adel Adel Latif, who is with the United Nations Development Program as a Special Strategic Advisor. His work has recently centered on uh, the very, very important Arab development reports, um, which are probably some of the best data and information that we have on the region and changes in the region, and some of the clues to the grievances um, that are motivating uh, a lot of the changes that we've seen, uh, especially since 2011. Um, before his term at, at UNDP, uh, he spent 20 years in uh, the foreign ministry of Egypt, with the rank of ambassador. We also have Mohammed uh, Baharoun, who is the director and founder of Behuth, which is a think tank based in Dubai. Uh, they focus on public policy, and Mohammed brings to us a wealth of experience about the GCC region, the UAE in particular. Um, he has a career as, uh, as a journalist and writer as well. So I'm just gonna take a couple of moments and sort of frame um, what our work is in this panel, what we're trying to engage on the issues. Um, and then I'll have each of the speakers give us kind of a 10-minute view um, on what they see as challenges and obstacles um, and potential for growth. And then I'd really like to leave a lot of time to the audience. Um, and so please start thinking of your questions. We want to be fully engaged here. Everybody is, is welcome to, um, to pose a question, a comment. Um, so please uh, keep that in mind. Um, I think when we are kind of posing this question of economic inclusion, um, it reflects some of the obstacles to growth and um, really some of the problems that we're seeing in regional stability. So when we, when we talk about um, the, the efforts of the GCC states to diversify, the implications are much, much wider that we're seeing throughout the MENA region. And I think you'll all be familiar with the context. There's sort of what I see as three motivating factors to, to change models, especially economic models, political economic models in the Gulf states. Um, and the first is that the, the resource-fueled um, growth, state-led growth, which achieved many wonderful things in this region, um, has kind of come to its, its term limit. Um, and so we need a new model for growth. We need a new, new way that the state can't do everything, right? So we need to include more private sector actors, um, and we need to create more avenues for participation. And that's simply a factor of changes in the global economy and in changes in oil markets, right? Um, we're going to see lower prices for longer is the projection, though I don't um, profess to have <laughs> absolute certainty on where that will be, but that's the general consensus. Um, and we're also seeing that the, the cycle of growth, we can't have economic cycles in the Gulf states that are so dependent on state <coughs> investment when oil prices are high, because that cycle ends. Um, and if the state is in charge of fueling everything, then when the low periods come, we see these contractions in the, in the regional economies. And those ripple effects are spreading wider. Um, the regional impacts, of course, we're seeing in remittance flows. We see it in foreign direct investment. And we see it in aid. And as we go into a period of necessary post-conflict aid and reconstruction, where the Gulf states will be really, really pivotal, um, this becomes more important, that the, the sources of revenue need to be more sustainable so that the support that can be given to the wider region um, is more consistent. 
And last, I think we all are familiar with the shifts in MENA societies. So everyone is familiar with the idea of the youth bulge, um, of changing demographics in, um, in the kind of populations that we have, but also what people want. What are the sources of grievances? What about um, problems with economic mobility? Um, and a lot of us have done work on education, uh, especially for women. Women are generally well-educated, especially in the Gulf uh, and across the MENA region, but people aren't seeing access to the kind of jobs that they want. Uh, and they're also not seeing the kind of effective governance that they want. So take that as a kind of brief framing, the large issues that we want to go through. Um, and I'd like to start with Dr. Saidi. Um, I'd, I'd really like to hear what you see as the key risk to the region, challenges that governments are facing in terms of their public finance, um, and their capacity for stimulating what you might define or, or how we might define the right kind of growth or a different pattern of growth. So I'll Thank give you. you the floor. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, salam alaikum, as we say in this part of the region. The salam, of course, as you know, means peace, except that we don't have a lot of it, so wishing it is something we all wish for. Let me start off perhaps at a high level. I want to talk really about what the geoeconomics. And if you start at a high level, um, think of what are the major events that happened after the Second World War. Um, there are four to five I think of. The first is Suez Canal, east of Suez 1961, which ended the British Empire. The next one was of course the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which end, meant the end of the Soviet Empire as we knew it. 2007, 2008 was the great financial crisis, which in my view ended the American financial empire as we had known it until then. We're still living the aftermath of that. 2011 is the Arab firestorm, not the Arab Spring, and we're still continuing to see the consequences of that until today. 2017, with the recent announcement we might get today um, of Trump uh, recognizing uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel might be the fifth major event. We don't know. Let's wait and see. History in the region tells us you should not react immediately to what happens on the day. Wait a little bit to see what the consequences. I mention these because these are major events which have consequences. So when you look at the landscape of our region, uh, I tend to describe it using the three T's, there are countries in turmoil, there are countries in transition, there are countries in transformation. The countries in turmoil are countries like Yemen, Syria, Iraq, Libya, countries in transition, Tunisia, um, Egypt, others, countries in transformation, Saudi Arabia, are probably the single most important um, event happening in so far as the Gulf states are concerned. Why are these important and why are the three T's important? Because they're driven by three elements. Number one are the demographics that you mentioned. This is a region which has some of the youngest population on earth. 30% of the MENA region are below 24 years of age. In the Gulf countries, 23 to 24% are below 24 years of age. The consequences of that means that the demographics drives infrastructure spending. And it means not only physical infrastructure, it has to mean social infrastructure, education, health, and everything that goes with it. That has to be a major driver of that. But it also means that the single most important economic policy objective has got to be job creation and employment. We have some of the highest unemployment rates. Indeed, they are the highest unemployment rates on earth of youth. Over 30% in the countries of the region, including educated youth. And for some of the Gulf countries, if you look at, if you believe the numbers for Oman, the youth unemployment is over 50%. In Saudi Arabia, youth unemployment is over 31%. The unemployment rate of women educated is over 40%. So what you're talking about is though, though we have educated our youth, we have not educated them for jobs, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So the demographics is a major factor we have to always look at. Second one is, of course, conflicts. And we need to think about how we want to resolve those conflicts. And I'll 
come back very quickly into what I call fault lines underlying these conflicts. The third driving force is, of course, is the new oil normal, which you mentioned. Oil prices, the downside risk is there. Uh, what we're now seeing is perhaps a small rise, but with shale oil, with renewable energy, the large decline in solar, um, it is clear that we run the risk of a lot of the oil of the region, which has been the main wealth, becoming stranded assets. What I mean by stranded assets is that eventually, somewhere down the line, it will not be economic to extract the oil, at least for current uses. You might want to extract it for other uses, maybe nanomaterials, materials, others, but not for current uses. So a big transformation has to take place. So what underlies this fractured landscape? Um, I'd like to submit to you there are five fault lines that we need to think of. And you need to think deeper when you talk about security and economic diversification. You have to go what underlies that. And I think there are five fault lines. The first one has to do with governance and institutions. Um, it is about voice and accountability. It is about addressing the issues of corruption, bribery, nepotism, um, rife across the region. We rank very badly in terms of that. So how do you address the governance? Um, and how do you get representation? That's one issue. Second issue is the relationship between religion and state. Uh, most of you here uh, know European history, plus the history of many regions. The Europeans killed each other for about 200 years. Um, Catholics versus Protestants, etc. On what is the role of religion and state? We have not yet addressed that in our region. What is the role of Islam and the state? Our intellectuals, our clerics, etc., have not addressed this issue. We need to address this issue. What is that relationship? Are you going to go towards secularism or not? If you listen to the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, he's now called for moderate Islam. And that, I would submit to you, is probably the most important statement made in Saudi Arabia. Not, not Neom and the new city. No, a, a deep transformation. Related to that, of course, um, is the Sunni-Shia schism. That is another fault line across the region which we need to address. Third major fault line is the issue of economic diversification. And what is the role of government versus the private sector? And when we think about economic diversification, we need to think about four elements within that. First one, as we usually think of, is what is the role of the non-oil sector? That is only one element, and what we need to be careful about is that people look at the statistics of the non-oil sector and they say, oh, the non-oil sector is growing. But when we look at the shocks, the shocks to the oil sector because of the important role of government in the non-oil sector transmit themselves to the non-oil sector because it's about government spending on infrastructure and everything else. So that is an illusion. <clears throat> you need to look at the non-governmental non-oil sector. What is the private sector doing? That is essential. So look at the statistics from that point of view. So production is one element. More important is trade diversification. That is, what is your ability to diversify your export base? More than 85% to 90% of our exports in the region are oil and energy related. That is not the future. That is not where you create competitiveness. That is not when you, where you enter global supply chains. So trade diversification, I will submit to you, is more important than production diversification. Of course, they're related to each other, but you need to focus on what are the policies that allow you to diversify trade. The third one, of course, is government revenue diversification, um, highly dependent on oil. So for the Gulf countries, you take a country like Saudi Arabia at the eve of the shock, 90% of government revenue came from oil. So when you had the oil shock, you had a double shock. One, a fiscal shock, which transmitted itself internally, but also an external shock because you lost most of the value of your exports, and therefore it became a balance of payments, a current account shock. So an external shock as well as an internal shock. So diversification of government revenues is clearly very important. And we're seeing the beginning of that, very modest, that at 5%, um, important. It's a fiscal reform 
but still very small. So in the years to come, in the decades to come, you're going to have to have different sources of revenue. Different sources of revenue also mean accountability, that, uh, as we well know, uh, no taxation without some sort of voice and representation. So how will that come up? The fourth element of diversification is international investment. Um, if you take a small country like uh, a Bahrain or Oman, you cannot diversify internally, do agriculture, manufacturing, industry, etc., and services and all the rest. You need to think of what does your sovereign wealth fund do? How do you invest internationally to get revenues and diversify your sources of revenues to avoid shocks? So that's a major um, fault line that, that you need to think of. Fourth fault line um, is education. And this has to be education for employment. We spend billions on education. But we educate people who are unemployable. We need to give them the right types of skills. And that, of course, means digital skills above all else. So education for employment is a major element moving forward. Fifth fault line and you pointed to it, is the role of women. The labor force participation rate of women in the Arab world is some of the lowest in the world, alongside sub-Saharan Africa. That needs to change. You need a big transformation. The educational attainment of women is higher than that of the men. They achieve better PISA scores. They do better at STEM as much as we can um, measure it. So there you need a big cultural transformation. And I think what is very interesting is that it is the Gulf that is leading that, and particularly the UAE um, has played a much more important role in bringing women into the labor force, um, empowering them. So that is, those are the five fault lines. So um, I'm conscious about time. Where, where do we go from here? Um, there are several elements, I think, that we need to think of. The first is that the Gulf today has got to play the leadership role. If we were holding this conference maybe 15 to 20 years ago, the outlook would have been, now what is the role of Egypt um, being the most populous and the largest country in the Arab world? The, the politics and the geoeconomics and the geopolitics was very different from what it is today. Today, the center of power of the Arab world is in the Gulf countries. So they need to assume leadership. So that, that is one element. That means two things. Um, it means greater economic integration uh, among them. It's not clear that this is going to happen given current events. But you need that greater integration uh, because when you're negotiating an in international trade, when you're thinking about your role in the world economy, your power depends on whether you speak with one voice as opposed to separate voices. The GCC countries, for example, have not been um, instrumental in entering world trade. So the number of trade agreements that we have is very limited. We need to think of new trade agreements, for example, with China. It's our number one trade partner uh, for the GCC countries. It's the main source of exports for our oil and energy. Uh, India is next door, we haven't done enough. So one part is regional integration, which looks like a pipe dream at the moment, and the other one is international integration. What are you doing in global supply chains? If you want to diversify economically, uh, to me it's very straightforward, you have to enter global supply chains. And the global supply chains today are not those of the past. They're not out of Europe and they're not out of the United States. They are with emerging markets. They are with Asia. So the question is, what is your role in the road and belt? What is your role with China, and what are you doing about it? And how many of you are learning Mandarin? And how many of your children are learning Mandarin? You need to ask yourself that. Second, um, we have a number of countries which have been destroyed by war. Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen. Cost of reconstruction, 250 billion for Syria, <clears throat> probably 700 billion for Iraq, Yemen, who knows, it's continuing, but let's say maybe 70 billion, 100 billion. Libya, uh, you put all of that together, 1.2, 1.3 trillion dollars. Question, 
eventually that's going to have to happen. Maybe not in 2018, who knows? But we know that big events can lead to big changes as well. So we need to think about how we're going to finance the reconstruction. It's going to be important because if you don't finance that reconstruction, then although you may have defeated Daesh militarily, you have not addressed the issue of Daeshism. The main issue is going to be how do you address, look at those fault lines, look at the poverty, look at the inequality. All of that helps fuel Daeshism, and you need to address Daeshism. And it's not going to be defeated militarily. You're going to have to have a different answer to what goes into young people's and young men's brains. So reconstruction is going to be important. Otherwise, those millions of refugees, and unfortunately today, we have 65% of the world's refugees and forcibly displaced people of the world are in the Arab world. Right? You need to address that. Otherwise, you'll have another wave of Daeshism or another form of it down the line. How do we finance that? I would submit that we need to think of setting up an Arab bank for reconstruction and development. The time has come for that. We are the only region in the world that hasn't, doesn't have an Arab a bank for reconstruction and development. Africa has one, Latin America has one, Asia has one. Even the Europeans, when they had to, to absorb Central and Eastern Europe, created an EBRD. It is time for us to take responsibility and do that. And here again, I think it's the GCC which needs to do that. The third element, I think, um, has to do with education. We need a revolution in education. I must applaud first the UAE for um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid's one million Arab coders. Yes, that puts the point where it belongs. But it needs to go beyond coding. We need to change the curriculum from nursery onwards to educate our young people so that they integrate the digital economy. Artificial intelligence, big data, robotics are going to be transformative. If we miss out again, we missed out on the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, are we going to miss out on the fourth? That's the issue. So you need to revise all the curricula. That means a massive investment in technology and industry, massive investment in STEM across the board and preparing our young people onwards from that. I'll just rest there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saidi. That was excellent. I think you've, you've put a lot on the table for us to consider, but it's also a good transition to look at then, you know, this, this is a lot of a central ask, a very big financial ask that, you, that you've put forward. So from a multilateral agency, uh, from the international community, from uh, people who work in development, these are challenges that Dr. Abdel Latif is, is very familiar with, but how do you pay for them and what do you do when the region and regional alliances and regional organizations um, are dysfunctional. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's always very difficult to speak after uh, I know, Dr. Saidi. Tough. <laughs> so I will try to build on what he said. But f let me first thank uh, the Arab Gulf States Institute and uh, the sponsor Raytheon for inviting us and considering our organization to participate at this event. And also, I'm, uh, we are always very happy at the United Nations to uh, address conferences in United Arab Emirates, uh, maybe the only oasis for peace and prosperity in this region, which helps also to think and reflect about the future of this region. Um, I will address the questions and build on what Dr. Saidi said in three points. The first point, we were very happy actually to see that you selected the issue of economic inclusion and tying this with security. Economic inclusion is actually one of the imperatives of the new agenda 2030. You will find that three goals of the 17 goals of the new agenda actually are addressing the question of economic inclusion. And most importantly for this event, the role of the private sector for the first time has been emphasized in the agenda 2030. We know that during the work of the UN, we are always shying away of what is the role of the private sector because we are an intergovernmental institution. And even after the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall in 1990, we were struggling all the time how we can work with the private sector and include it in the work of our organization. 
thanks to uh, the Secretary General Kofi Annan for the first time in 2000 pushing for the issue of social responsibility. But now we think, of course, in a totally different way is how we have a partner uh, in the private sector, not providing resources for the United Nations, but helping in the implementation of Agenda 2030. And we'll come to this issue uh, in uh, my third point. The second point is what Dr. Saidi has been painting, the picture of the region, of course. It's uh, very difficult to be optimistic at this time. And even since long time, it was very difficult to be optimistic. But as Tom Kennedy said, we have to look at what is below the iceberg. And we have been trying to do this for a long time. Since the year 2000, we started producing the Arab Human Development Report. The first one came in 2002 after 9-11. And we were trying to see what really is happening in this region from the eyes of international organization and the United Nations. And we have been actually painting a picture that maybe was um, a little bit, or maybe was very uh, pessimistic. We looked at the Arab countries during their um, path, development path, since the 60s and until the year 2000. You will find a very um, important pattern in all the Arab countries, whether they went through the socialist role or even they didn't go, is the concentration of economic and economic power within the state. And that actually, uh, as Dr. Saidi said, it paralyzed the whole society. It was maybe important during the 50s and 60s to invest in health, education, massively, in order to create this middle class that will actually support the state and populate the institutions of the state because you needed uh, graduates to work in ministries, to work in the security sector, to work in the army. And that actually was important in a certain period of time, 60s, 70s, maybe 80s. But the Arab countries actually were stuck in this model until now, where you're still spending a lot of money providing free education for universities while you don't need this investment. And then what happened is you find that the quality in basic education has been dropping dramatically. So in all the uh, tests, what we call it trends in mathematics and science, you will find most of the Arab countries, the students from grade four to eight, they are actually below the global average, including even in countries in the Gulf region. We'll find only exception is in some private schools, like in Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt, you'll find they are above the global average, which actually creating this inequality in society. So you have already a group of young Arabs who could join globalization, but very tiny, and the rest of the population are actually marginalized. And that, of course, fuels and gets to, to the issue of how you can have economic inclusion while you have a divided society. People can work in Google and Facebook, and people cannot work except in the informal sector. And that actually is building this kind of grievances that was unintentionally created by the state. So this regional scene, actually, if you look at the question of health, it is another important issue. This is one of the few regions in the world that has been achieving uh, a very uh, strong progress in health, which was translated into a demographic increase. I mean, if you take the Gulf countries, they were the fastest, actually, in increasing life expectancy in a very short period, maybe in 20 years. People were gaining almost from 10 to 15 years in their life. I mean, the, the life expectancy in the 60s was maybe below 50, or in the 60s, now it is 77 in many countries, including this country. So with this demographic increase, which of course is a very good thing that people live longer, but then you have also more people. As Dr. Saidi said, you have this youth demography, which will continue with us until 2050. And there are only two regions actually in the world you have this increase, Africa and the Middle East and North Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa and of course the Middle East and North Africa. This is the biggest concentration of youth in the world in the, until maybe another uh, century. 
which means that, for example, we are looking at the figures. In 40 years, the Arab countries plus Iran and Turkey will get close to the population of China. So imagine you have this biggest concentration on the southern Mediterranean, the first time in history that the southern Mediterranean will be more than the north Mediterranean. And of course, this has all implications on the question of migration and transformation. Well, the, the problem that how Arab countries will be able to address the question of youth and related to that, the question of education and start the most important thing is how you have this radical transformation that the government will pull out of higher education and concentrate on basic education because that's the only way you will produce equality in society. Because you cannot produce equality after people join university. You have to produce it when the poor people are joining public schools. They have to be able to compete with those who have the means. And until now, Arab countries are very shy, or Arab governments, to address this issue. They can address the question of subsidies, energy and food, or devaluation of currency. But the critical issue is about human resources. How you will be able to mainstream this kind of equality at the level when people are born, were born, they will be able to advance in society in almost equal way rather than letting them departing, and you will find that the few, they have the, the means, and the, ma the, the majority of the people, they don't have except few, few means. And of course, related to that, the issue of violent extremism, which was addressed. Well, within this regional scene, we have to see that the Arab Gulf countries, or the GCC, they have been all the time the main pillar for stability in this region. Since the 60s, after the Arab-Israeli War in 1967, they have been bailing all the time their Arab brothers, whether in Egypt or in Syria, and the massive trans transfer of money and resources, either from governments or Arab funds, have been massive, you know. I mean, we tried, you know, to find some, some uh, uh, data about that. The World Bank produced in 2010 uh, uh, a report on uh, development aid focused only on what the Arab development funds provided to some Arab countries from 1978 to 2010. The first country was Syria, over $33 billion. Coming after that, Egypt, with almost $31 billion. And Egypt, of course, was less because of the time when Egypt signed the Camp David Accord. Of course, they didn't receive any resources. In addition to that, you have, the, of course, the remittances. And in addition to that, you have foreign direct investment. So which actually confirms what Dr. Saidi said, how the Arab Gulf countries will come and to be less shy about their regional role. Because without the, this regional economy, this is the engine, the only engine that exists in this region. And if this engine will not pull the others, it will become, as I said, oasis for peace and security, but for how long it will be able to maintain this internal peace and security. So if we would like to see what is the role ahead, the road ahead, and to be, you know, try to think and be a little bit optimistic, and we say all the time in the 50s and 60s, we'll be over optimistic what the Arabs will be, will be doing, and at that time, we have more means than today. But maybe because we have the challenges now and we are facing exactly the issues that we have been shying away from it, like the issue of identity or the issue of Arab integration, and we have been blinded maybe with Arab nationalism rather than economic integration, maybe the young people, we have to see how they think about that. And you will be surprised that they are much more realistic than the previous generation because they are living under a situation where they don't have the means actually and the luxury of the previous generation to dream. They don't have that big space to dream and they have to address their 
a challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we produced, actually, last year, um, um, our human development report on the issue of youth, and we have been trying to collect the data and the surveys about young Arabs. So in, for each person who is jo joining violent extremism, violent extremist organization, you will find maybe 10 or 20 or 30 are trying to work on, on finding their, their way in life. So we tend all the time, of course, to focus on the issue that comes in the news, because if 300 are killed, of course, this is an issue but that the news would, would cover. But what are the others are doing? That's actually what we have to look at the majority of the others, how they are trying to find solutions. You'll find a lot of young people from Morocco to Kuwait, you know, are trying to find solutions in startups, small businesses. And we have actually to try to pull all this, you know, good innovation initiatives in order to instill a sense of optimism in this region. Because if you focus only on ISIS or Daesh, and then you forget the others, Actually, you are inviting them to join. Because to be in the news, you don't need to have your own startup. You just go and fight whoever you would like to fight. And that actually is also a media issue, that we have to pay attention to it, how you encourage young people, how you also bring their, uh, their ideas and their initiative to the news, rather than put them in the dark. Our work also with the uh, private sector has been improving, and we are trying to see how we partner with the private sector in creating businesses within the Agenda 2030. Two days ago, we launched a report. It's called Be Better Business, Better World, focusing on the Middle East and North Africa. And four of the areas, actually, that we focused on is that in Agenda 2030, the issue of energy and materials, the question of cities and urbanization, and health and well-being, and food and agriculture. In, in, these three, in these four areas, there are opportunities above $600 billion in the next 13 years that the business community is considering, you know, that they can do some uh, profits out of it. But of course, it requires a change in government policies. Of course, the United Arab Emirates has been leading all the Arab countries in the question of uh, ease of doing business. The other countries, actually, they are trying to catch on, and that's how United Arab Emirates can help, because they have actually addressed all the question of ease of doing business and try to get it one by one, how to improve the performance of the country. And this model is very important to the others, how they have done it. Because you, if you would like to have a business, for example, in a country like Egypt, uh, we have been working, for example, in 10 years ago with Hernando de Soto to see how we can address this issue. And we put, you know, sometimes you have to go 40 measures, you know, bureaucratic measures in order to have your own business. So how we can cut all this and we cut the time and the cost? Because the question is not that we are helping business to do business. The question is the, the clock is ticking, in fact if we will not be able in the next decade to address all these issues, it will be extremely difficult to do it after that with a bigger demographic population. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you're all noticing some themes here. So economic inclusion really depends on a transformation of the state, um, and it also depends on a transformation of the way we think about opportunity. Um, and Mohammed Bahroun, this is what you do. You study public policy, and especially from the perspective of the GCC and, and here in the United Arab Emirates. Um, what do you see as key challenges? And, and you have a very kind of uh, futuristic view, I know, of um, how different partners and different kinds of um, both rising, new rising powers in the region will be influential. Um, and like Dr. Saidi and uh, Dr. Abdul Latif mentioned, that these are, these are different kind of um, both business and industrial opportunities that, um, that we need to be preparing for. Uh, thank you, Karen. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, as you've guessed by now, I'm not the economist in the room. Uh, 
<laughs> so I will uh, try and uh, steer, steer away from uh, the area of expertise of uh, uh, such di distinguished uh, leader. Of course, uh, 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 both uh, participants have focused on some of the uh, uh, local challenges. Uh, some of them are even security challenges uh, for countries that are doing transformation. I will also try and uh, look at some of the regional uh, challenges. Uh, some of the questions that is been posed by, by Karen and, and, and this excellent panel is, can economy change security? Is this the idea, is that economical diversification will have an implication on security, uh, and, uh, uh, both internally and regionally? Uh, there has been a number of, uh, of reports and, and, and even views that the UAE is expanding its power, it's sort of flexing its muscles, it's uh, using that hard power to gain economic uh, uh, you know, uh, presence outside the UAE. And, 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 and one of those uh, uh, comments uh, that were quite interesting and extreme to me is a comparison to uh, Dubai Ports World uh, to East India in the way that it is leading out the expansion of the UAE outside. And I think that is quite interesting uh, and also quite uh, wrong in a sense, because uh, Dubai Ports World started e economic diversification way before anything else that is security uh, uh, um, uh, connected. And uh, it's, it's some of the ports that it's operating in, 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 uh, in Horn of Africa, and I will use the Horn of Africa as an example of, of that type of challenge, uh, have preceded any type of security and, and uh, involvement of the UAE in, in, in the region. Uh, for instance, uh, Dubai Ports Ports currently operates something like 77 uh, uh, inland uh, uh, ports and, uh, and inland terminals and, and ports around uh, the globe in about something like uh, 40 countries. And you do not find any security presence of the UAE in all of these 40 countries. So uh, that comparison to me is, is not quite uh, well grounded. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, people talk a lot about uh, Eritrea and, and Asab, but Siasia Forki was here in the UAE in something like 2004, asking for cooperation to lead development in, in, uh, in, er in Eritrea. So this type of, of, uh, of perception, I don't think is, is quite uh, actual. However, there are cases where uh, di economic diversification can possibly change uh, security structures. And I'll give you an example of the case of, of uh, technology transformation. Uh, Dr. Saidi pointed out uh, issues of, uh, of a, a transformation of economy. M the main aspect of the transformation in a post-oil economy is a knowledge economy. And that's what we see pretty much in the UAE and in Saudi. Uh, Neom uh, is pretty much focused on, on, on robotics and uh, uh, advanced science and technology. That also is driving STEM education and driving. Uh, but that requires new partnership. And uh, if I will point out the, uh, uh, the type of offer by Russia, for instance, uh, to the UAE to buy its fourth generation fighter, which has been waiting to buy from the US for quite a long time, with the offer to partner on developing a fifth generation fighter. That's a very lucrative offer if you think about it, because what they're saying is that we're offering you knowledge transfer, something that neither the US nor the EU is willing to offer because of controls on, on, uh, on technology transfer. Uh, this type of, of uh, offer, if it's accepted, I don't see it, any signs that it's going to be accepted, but if it's accepted, it would mean that there's going to be a different type of change. I mean, this is, again, uh, very much scenario building, but if you look into, if Russia says that not only we're going to help you with, you know, offering or, or developing your fifth generation uh, fighter, but we'll also help you in developing your own indigenous uh, uh, air defense system based on the S-300. So we'll help you with your 
you know, missile program, defense missile program, and then we'll help you also with that. That would be extremely difficult for something like the UAE or Saudi to look away from. So if that is accepted, that is possibly going to change long-standing you know, uh, relationship and would possibly change the idea of regional security structures as we have traditionally known it. There's also new trends if you want to take it away from the regional to the uh, global level. Uh, Dr. Saeed mentioned China. And yes, China, the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative is uh, uh, changing the way we look at uh, economic uh, uh, structures and economic relations. But also China is investing a lot in what I would call deep blue economy. China is investing a lot in uh, deep sea seabed excavation uh, because of its drive for rare earth minerals. Uh, currently, uh, China has got something like, no, we know that China is, for instance, providing 95% of the world's uh, rare earth minerals. But it, because of that uh, type of, uh, uh, of demand, it's now uh, is looking into an area of about 72,000 uh, kilometers in, 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 in uh, international waters, and which has had got concessions to excavate in deep sea uh, for our earth minerals. What we're seeing is, is a new colonialism happening in, in international waters. Something is driven by uh, knowledge economy, something that's driven by economic diversification, uh, but it will also pose some sort of a security challenge to the world and the way we see in, uh, traditional structures. And I would be uh, you know, interested to see to what extent that is going to affect how we see those type of relationships. The other question is, can economy be security? I mean, can, can it be the basis of security? And I would like to look at post-conflict, as Dr. Saidi did, but in Yemen particularly. Uh, the involvement of the UAE in Yemen uh, hasn't been just militarily. The, uh, what we look at as the uh, uh, programs that uh, the UAE Red Crescent is providing, it's not only aid, it's not only blankets and food. It goes beyond that into uh, rehabilitation of ports, rehabilitation of uh, schools, rehabilitation of uh, power generators, uh, rehabilitation of roads, rehabilitation of uh, ports and airports, all of that is supposed to provide a normality of, uh, of economy, and that normality of economy should support long-standing or long-term stability in, in, in Yemen. Uh, that type of approach we've seen also happening in Somalia, we've seen happening in Mali. Now, Mali, which the UAE has been involved in, in, in security with, with France, is now negotiating with a, 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 a port deal with the Biports world. The idea is that that type of deal, that type of, of uh, economic support, is going to help security. So there is a normative way of looking at, at uh, economic relationship as a basis of uh, stability. Now, uh, we've talked about the transformation of, of Saudi Arabia and its focus on, on uh, uh, its transformation from uh, oil-based economy into uh, a more of a knowledge economy. However, that is, cannot be achieved without trade. And that's the major transformation that's happening in Saudi. Saudi is pretty much changing its, the way it looks itself as the leader of the Islamic world because of, of the two holy mosques, into the leader of economy in this region. That means it has to open up. So the, the transformation that's happening in Saudi is not cosmetic. It's not to please the West. It's actually very, very vital to its trade relationship with everyone else. Because without that type of, of transformation, social transformation, uh, you know, uh, the, the Red Sea uh, tourist area uh, is not going to be helpful. Who is going to go to Saudi Arabia to bathe in, in the Red Sea if you actually have very strong, uh, you know, uh, 
policies when it comes to how people enjoy themselves. So I think the transformation is, is actually real and it's important to the way, this, uh, the way Saudi Arabia is, is looking at itself. Again, the Red Sea, we've talked about Horn of Africa, but the Red Sea also, we can see more investment in stability. Saudi Arabia's, for instance, uh, deal with Sudan on, on uh, oil excavation uh, is one part of it. Uh, the relationship between Sudan and uh, the UAE in, on the economic level is ex also expanding. The relationship between uh, Sudan, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE with Somalia and also with Eritrea is expanding. So these are new type of relationship, but they're supposed to help stability, and stability would lead to security. Now, is this going to change security structures? Yes. Uh, practically, the UAE, Saudi, haven't been a big partners in the Red Sea security previously. I think that is going to change and, and as, as we see it. And I think, in, in a sense, the uh, Islamic Military Alliance uh, is going to be one of those vehicles that would help people help with, with uh, stability. Now, again, this is, in a sense, motivated by a lack of putting boots on the ground, if you want, in those areas. Uh, which would make security of, those, of that region more indigenous than it has uh, been uh, before. So again, that economic diversification is going to be a very important aspect of providing uh, stability and security. Now, looking at all of these issues, where could that lead us in the future? To what extent can, this, can we learn or take lessons from? And I think the time when we're talking about free trade agreements with nations or other uh, EU, for instance, is, is not going to be feasible if we are going to provide the same goods. I think we need now to talk about free knowledge agreement or a free knowledge clause in free trade agreements. We cannot continue having that type of relationship where I want to develop my own uh, uh, scientific and uh, uh, industrial infrastructure, and there are big dividing lines between where technology can go and where it cannot go. And I think that is one is of, of the issues that will need to be discussed over and over, especially that other parts of the world are willing to, ch to share knowledge. Another area is to look at uh, the, the uh, issue of uh, private uh, the public-private partnerships. And there are a number of models that we can see that has actually gave uh, uh, very good results. One of them is the program like Mubadala. Mubadala is a public-private partnership of some sort that's actually making a lot of contribution to uh, stability, not only in, on, on the level of, of diversification, but also on how security can be uh, a, a relationship uh, to development. Uh, again, I've mentioned uh, Dubai Ports World. I think that is also uh, that the level of uh, relationship between uh, Dubai Ports World and the UAE government, for instance, in extending help. The, as as uh, Karen started with, the state cannot always do uh, everything. It will need partners. And I think that type of partnership needs to be looked at again. On a, on a regional level, did we get to that type of partnership? I don't see elements of that happening yet, but that's an area in which that type of partnership can, uh, can happen. And I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you very much. I'd like to take some questions from the audience now. Um, we still have maybe 20 minutes or so to go. Um, but it struck me there's some irony in, <laughs> in, our, uh, in our panel in that, you know, we set off to talk about diversification and um, we ended up talking a lot about the state and the role of the state and the continued necessity of the state and efforts to increase state capacity um, in education, in um, uh, delivering a post-industrial sort of economy that won't be just focused on export manufacturing. I mean, these are, these are real challenges, right, that require uh, public policy. Um, so I wonder if we um, are making too long of a list of asks, and especially in, in you know, the regional demands on post-conflict reconstruction, 
because the development models, if there is to be such a strong role for the GCC states, um, the development models that they have used domestically are not suited um, to a post-conflict reconstruction. I think, uh, Karen, you're being a bit diplomatic. <laughs> um, I, I take very much what Dr. Abdel Latif was saying earlier. There was a period in the 50s and 60s where governments played a preponderant role. However, we also need to look at the economic model that they chose at the time. It was one which was socialist oriented mm -hmm. as opposed to private sector oriented. So if you look across the whole Middle East, MENA region, uh, whether it's in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, those were dominated, state-owned enterprises dominated with the military, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that continues to today. I mean, look at Egypt today. Um, that, that economic transformation has not taken place. The Gulf countries were highly concentrated simply on their natural resources um, and didn't think of diversification because the wealth was there, so you were not challenged. So the economic development model needs to radically change okay. because you're not going to be able to enter digital economy, you're not going to be able to enter AI and all the rest uh, until you free up the private sector. Um, so privatization, I think, has got to be on the agenda it is stated as such as part of 2030 and transformation in Saudi Arabia. I think that is the, certainly the direction to go. Um, Dubai, for example, Abu Dhabi are taking initiatives in terms of things like uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, big data. You mentioned ease of doing business. Mm -hmm. If you look across the region, um, setting up a business for an SME can consume up to 26% of per capita income, okay, 26%. For the OECD countries, it's about 3%. If you look at access to finance and inclusion, which we were talking about, only 2% of loans in the GCC countries actually go to SMEs. Across the MENA regions, only 8% of loans that actually goes to the SMEs. So that, you, you need a big transformation there. What it means, of course, is that government has got to take less of the credit and you need to open up the avenue for the private sector. So I think the big challenge moving forward, and you rightly pointed to it, is how do you free, up the pri free it up for the private sector? Uh, I'm encouraged by what's happening in Saudi Arabia um, because Saudi has announced that the education, health, and other sectors, transportation, and the rest are going to be opened up to the private sector. If that happens, uh, that can be very transformative, including in particular in education. We need to see that happen. So when I look at Saudi today, um, it's, I call it too big to fail. Mm -hmm. What I mean by too big to fail is that the experiment, um, the transformation that is happening in Saudi Arabia is going to be extremely important for the rest of the countries of the region. We need it, we need it to succeed. Because if that Saudi transformation happens, I think it'll open up the door for the other countries of the region, particularly the GCC and other oil exporters, to go the same way. So it is very clear that the road forward has got to be one that is driven by the private sector. The role of government has got to be enabling it, has got to have the laws and laws in place. If I look at the digital transformation, um, we, it, it was mentioned earlier on cybercrime and cybersecurity, absolutely, but you need to have the e-laws in place. You need to facilitate the establishment of companies that can be e-companies that can be purely digital. That's what the young people want. Um, otherwise, as Dr. Abdelatif was saying, our young people are going to enter into a highly divided world. Um, we, we didn't mention how severe inequality is mm -hmm. in the Arab world. Let me give you some numbers and they will shock you as they shocked me when I, when I researched them. The top 10%, the top decile, share, has share in income is 61%, the top decile. We talk a lot about the United States as being highly unequal. It's 47%, so ours, ours is 61%. So the top 1% gets 26% of income. The bottom 50% gets 9% of income. So one of the major issues is inequality and poverty. And we need to address those in terms of creating opportunities for our young people. Every year, 700,000 young people enter the labor force in, in, in Egypt. 700,000 every year. 
if you don't create jobs for them, and no net new jobs have been created over the past three years, you've got 2.1 million that are going to join Tahrir Square or the equivalent. So, how do you move forward? You need the infrastructure in place. That's why I was pointing to this Arab Bank for reconstruction. Mm -hmm. You need that. But let the private sector do that. Open up the door for PPP. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a legal framework no for framework. that. Uh, Kuwait has it. UAE mm. has the beginning of it. Saudi is announcing, working on privatization and PPP laws. Let's put the frameworks in place. Let's open it up for the private sector to, to enter. I completely agree. Do you want to add anything before we take questions from yes, the audience? Yes, I mean, building on your wisdom, uh, Dr. Saidi, and your ideas. Uh, in fact, what the question of demography really has to be taken into consideration in Arab countries. And I will give an example. Egypt, in the census of 1947, was 19 million. This year, 100 million. 80 million, you know, in how many years? Huh? So, and this actually will continue not only in Egypt, but all the countries in crisis, like Iraq, Yemen, Yemen. Sudan, and uh, Palestine, the Palestinian territories, they will be doubled in the next 30 years. And of course, when you say that, it's mainly young people. And when Dr. Saidi said about the unemployment, it is not only that the un unemployment is high, the rate is very high, but young people, they stay long time unemployed. So it's not only 40%, you can say, or 30, but they stay between two and three years sometimes out, outside the labor market, the formal labor market. So what happens is that the young people, they move, particularly in the big population countries like Egypt, Morocco, mm -hmm. and others, to the informal economy and informal housing. They want to live. And informal political voice and participation. So everything is under, you know, the table, no, you don't know how these people think. And that's the very dangerous thing. Mm. In a region also that is very highly urbanized. I mean, if you compare it to Africa, still a lot of people live in rural areas. But this region, mm. most of the people, for, for example, in the Gulf, above 80 to 90% they live in urban areas. And if even you move to countries like Egypt and Morocco, we still have rural areas, it's almost coming above 50 to 60% now living in big urban concentrations, in informal areas where the government cannot sometimes have access to it. So imagine, you know, how the difficulty of also controlling this and the security issue. So the, the, the question that we have been actually urging governments as an international organization, not only us also, but the Britain Woods institutions, is the issue of the private sector. It's not that it is fashionable, but you have tried to do it for a long time as a government, and you didn't do it. You know, maybe China is doing it. Maybe South Korea have been able, you know, to have this state-led, you know, uh, growth or the developmental state, mm -hmm. but it failed in this region. So why you keep holding, you know, the economy in your hand while you are not performing? The other thing is how much actually it is draining the budget of the government in subsidizing subsidies. everything. So subsidies actually started as a good cause for social development, but then it became a political issue. And the governments cannot withdraw it. You know, at the, at the beginning of the 50s and 60s, government were subsidizing things because they are trying to move people outside of poverty, which happened, you know, inequality at that time was very low. But then it became a political issue. Governments cannot get out of it. The same thing with higher education. So the transformation actually is imperative and without transformation in the mindset of government, it will not be possible actually to speak about any positive change in the future. The private sector is not actually a fashionable issue in the Arab region. It has to happen. Otherwise, how young people will find opportunities? I mean, governments cannot anymore you know, provide uh, opportunities in the government or the public sector, you have a bloated already bureaucracy. And if you go even in the 90s, a famous Egyptian scholar wrote a book is about uh, overstating the Arab state, Nazih Ayubi, came in 1994 with this book. It showed you know, how governments were trying to absorb everything and control everything, and then by doing that, actually, it became obese, you know, 
and, and you have, now we have to streamline all this, and it is very painful. So how we will be able to sequence all this in the next 10 years is the big question mark. And the issue of security, because you have, it, has, it is raised in here, of course, the security sector absorbs a lot of resources in the Arab region, which is understandable. But how this can be positive for the economy? Because you have a big military sector. How investing in the military sector can benefit the technology in the Arab countries? Because you have a lot of engineers working in these militaries. How, you know, inventions and innovation even can ha happen inside the government? Because you have it even in the United States. A lot of new innovations came actually from the military. But this trickle-down effect, it doesn't happen in this region. I think, sure, go ahead. Because we didn't address it, and it's important for security, given, given the title of what you're doing. It has to do with climate change. And our region is one of the highest exposures to climate change and the most vulnerable. I mention that because of our high dependence on oil, on, on water. All of it is from outside the region. Um, increased diverse, uh, desertification, which is going to lead to more and more migration, particularly across Africa, across our region of the world. And there's a big security threat that's going to arise from that. So addressing the climate change is going to be one of the major issues moving forward. And here there's an opportunity, namely going into renewables. If we look at abiding by COP21 commitments and the opportunities in terms of renewables, you're talking about 700 billion that can be invested in renewables from now to 2030 across the, across the Arab world, across, and in particular the GCC. But climate change, I think, is a major consideration. If you look at, for example, what happened in, in Syria on the eve of, of the revolt, the drought, yeah. much of it had to do with droughts, much of it had to do with loss of income, migration from rural areas. So climate change, I would submit, is, is a major issue, particularly from a security point of view, and internal migration and displacement of populations. All right, so we have a lot on our uh, agenda. We've been talking about the obese state. I also think of it as a predatory state sometimes. So how do you rehabilitate um, um, stateness in the Arab world? How do we find new models for technology ecosystems and these pipelines, which we'll be discussing throughout the whole day, really, that's the purpose of, of why we're here today. What are new models for, um, for the private sector and the state to work together? Um, so I think we're, we're on the right themes. If you have a question, would you please raise your hand? Um, we have some microphones around, and, and just state your name and, and any affiliation. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Athel Yates from Khalifa University's Institute for International and Civil Security. Our eminent speakers have been talking about the continual efforts to improve state government outcomes and enabling the private sector. Well, one of the key elements of that is the bureaucracy and its culture in particular. And that could be characterised really as top-down, risk-adverse, process-driven, and centralised decision making. So my question is this, how, is it, how can you best change the bureaucratic culture when in many ways some say it mirrors national cultures? All right, let's take one more and then uh, our panel will respond. There was another at the same table, I believe, right? Or no? The second table, yeah. My name is Abdesalam Haikal. I run the Haikal Group, and we invest in the uh, creative, uh, in creative industries. Um, my, uh, two questions. The first is, how do we balance between immediate needs of reconstruction in turmoil countries and the long-term outlook for transformation in education, which we need to not only meet challenges of our countries today, but the transformation that's happening in the world in terms of, of, uh, of jobs. You know, I mean, the challenge here is that we depend on blue-collar jobs to absorb unemployment, and that's going to change because of automation. Uh, the, the, the second is, is there a view? I find that Arab integration is necessary for entrepreneurship in the region. Uh, some of the Gulf countries, I mean, Saudi Arabia is a big country, but the rest of the Gulf countries were, and as Dr. Saidi mentioned, they're the engine of growth in the region, but they're too small actually to create uh, economies and entrepreneurship on their own. So Arab integration is key. Is there a model 
for Arab integration outside the political model that failed? Good question. All right, who would like to go first? Um, I think there was a question of, about bureaucracy and, mm. and how you transform bureaucracy. Um, I think that's a very pertinent question, um, particularly if you look at countries that are trying to transform themselves like Saudi Arabia. Um, the tone at the top and the vision is there. You have a plan which was announced. We're national transformation plan. We're now into national transformation plan 2.0. We might have 3.0 soon. <laughs> we don't know. Um, at the top, in terms of ministers, Deputy ministers, it is very clear. The question is, how does the ministry and other agencies affect the change? And there you have the weakness in terms of bureaucracy. Um, I think that there is not much choice. Um, you have to break. What I mean by that is that you have to go to e-government. You have to shift entirely. It's going to be painful because it's going to mean that many people in the bureaucracies will end up without jobs, and you're going to have to face that. We talked about it a bit earlier about these transformations. What you really need is a new social contract across, across our, our countries of the region, and particularly the GCC. When you're removing subsidies, you're really saying, I want a new social contract because I nearly no longer can afford to be the welfare state I was in the 60s, 70s, and onwards to today. It's going to be painful, but the way forward has got to be e-government and intelligent government. Um, and by the way, e-government also helps you fight corruption and bribery. Um, I, I spend a lot of time in, in the UAE and Dubai. I can see that in, in, in Dubai, where they're moving towards e-government. It is transformative. It makes government extremely efficient. Um, I'm now working on a project with, with Dubai government, whereby by May 2018, to register a business, you'll be able to register a business in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. It currently takes 15 days. We're working now to use modern technologies to register in 15 minutes. It's, it's to capture the imagination. The minutes is not really important. But the idea is you need to use modern technology to transform government. And that means you need also to retrain government employees and drive them into the private sector. What it also means is that you need to reduce the gap between highly paid government employees and the private sector. So that shift has to start happening. If it means subsidizing jobs in the private sector, then do so. Um, give subsidies for employment of government employees and other into the private sector to, to, to have this transformation. Would anyone like to tackle the question on regional economic integration and automation of, of jobs? Or say something to the corruption question, if you'd like, please. Well, on, um, no, I, I would like just to briefly address the question of bureaucratic culture because people think that the Arab countries, you know, are old, you know. They, these are old societies but new states, you know. So the, the, the question of bureaucracy really is not that old as we think. It has started in the 50s and even with the countries that have older history, it didn't have actually a state, you know, uh, as we think today. So it is 60 years and things can change easily. So what I think is, without changing this culture, you will not be able actually to make many changes. The culture is the concentration at the capital, and you don't have any, you know, at the local level, very little power. And that's very important because to address the issues that Dr. Saidi said, climate change, issues related to crimes, to violent extremism, you don't have any power at the local level. Anything happens, it has to go up, and you know, until it goes up and, and the decision comes down, you know, between this time, things, a lot of things can happen, and disasters happen. So this issue of devolution and getting more decision-making power at the local level is a must. In even particularly in countries where you have big demography, you know, you cannot depend all the time on somebody will be calling the leader and informing, and then the decision trickles down. That actually is, is something that we need to address issues as it is. You know, we cannot say this is a culture. Culture can change, and it has changed 
And in 2011, nobody was expecting this to happen, and it happened. So things actually are accelerating. On the question of corruption, I myself was, when I started working with the UNDP, was one of the main issues is addressing the issue of how we address anti-corruption anti in the Arab countries. And most of the governments at that time, we cannot you know, talk about this issue. Now, the leaders, you know, in 15 years, the leaders themselves, they are taking this in their hand because they see how much it is affecting their yeah. economy. And this is a change of culture that happened in very short period. Without, you know, I mean, we have been knocking the doors, please sign the anti-corruption uh, convention of the United Nations that came in 2003. Some of them signed, ratified, but then they themselves, the leaders, they are taking decisions and they will not mention, you know, what's happening. But of course, it is, it is a must. On the regional integration, well, the original sin is this question of Arab nationalism that put the emphasis on the political issue. And, of course, it antagonized also many neighboring countries around the region without putting an emphasis on the real issue, which is you have a lot of small economies in small countries, and even with the big economies or the big demography, they cannot do it by themselves. It's, it's not, you know, a rocket science. They never try to work together. The private business can change this culture easily. They can work, and they work. You know, but they have also to have the support of the political leadership. You know, the private sector and the business can make it easier to work in several countries. And you find that. You find investments from UAE in Egypt, in Morocco, the same, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, and even some businessmen, they are trying to work from this country. So this culture of private business can help a lot to bridge the gaps and the, and the, and the challenges of working among the region. Uh, we have, for, for example, one of the things that we are trying to measure, if a, a private businessman would like to move from one country to another country. In some countries, you need 16 visas to move, you know, to visit the Arab region, the members of 22 states. These things, you know, we, sh we should find solutions, how the businessman can move easily without all these restric restrictions. I mean, you, how much time you spend, you know, to apply for a visa, and then and you don't have any intention even to live in this country. We, we have only a, a minute or two left. Dr. Saidi wants to make a comment. I'll, I'll just a quickly comment. address the issue of integration. Um, you need two things. You need to remove the barriers. And that effectively means two things. The engine of growth, as we all agree, I think, is in the Gulf states. You have two things that need to be changed. And I talk as an economist right now. I understand all the all the thinking and, and the issues behind. I understand those extremely well. But as an economist, I would say two things need to happen. You need to remove the Wikala system. You need to allow flexibility in the labor market. So if you have foreign human capital, it is highly productive, it is highly efficient, it has helped in economic development, allow it to move around. Don't shackle it with a Wikala system where you're forced and you have a sponsor. If you remove that, and you allow residency, long-term residency, then many of, much of your human capital will reinvest into the country instead of now sending it out, which is exactly what they're doing. Number two, you need to change the investment law and allow for 100% ownership of companies. If you do that, then it becomes much easier to establish a business. You will attract a lot of investment into many of the countries of the region. This idea that you limit foreign ownership to 49% is an illusion because all the entrepreneurs all have side deals with their local partners. So we, we know that. So remove that, remove that barrier. Open it up to, to investment. And the third thing is that we have so much opportunity of labor movement across the Arab world. You look at a country like Yemen, uh, 23, 24 million, I think, uh, at the moment. So instead of employing and educating Yemenis and others, we get uh, from the Indian subcontinent. We need, we need to change. We need to change all that. And it's perfectly feasible. And Egypt needs to open up to foreign investment so that you create jobs in Egypt instead of having Egyptians have to migrate 
to the Gulf countries to, to create a job. So these are all perfectly feasible. I mentioned two deep reforms which we need, among others. Last word to Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. Just a very quick caution remark uh, based on the question on bureaucracy and your remark on, on uh, uh, asking so much of the state. Uh, one, bureaucracy is not bad. Bureaucracy is good. Bureaucracy is an important element of any state. Slimming the bureaucracy, improving it, yes, but not replacing it, not giving it up. And I think the U.S. Is, prides itself, for instance, on its bureaucratic system that actually protects it from uh, you know, uh, abusing the system. A, a major challenge. I will not go into that right now. <laughs> uh, the second issue is that the state. The state is changing, but it is not going away. We cannot expect the state to become an unstate. We cannot expect the state not to play a leading role. And uh, in, in, this is particularly the example that Dr. Saidi mentioned in, in Dubai. And if I want to give an example, I usually don't like to use that example, but look at what Amar is doing in the marina area. It has built the infrastructure. It has built one major uh, uh, construction, but everything else around it has been built by the private sector. So the state is leading a certain direction, and it's opening up to the private sector to move. Do not expect the state not to play that role. And one final word is remember, remember China. China is still a state-oriented economy, but China is, is doing a huge leap because it is a state economy, because it's a one-party system, actually. Uh, but that means there's a, a testimony to what state can do as a leader of the private sector, rather than just sitting back and only regulating. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll all join me. I, I learned a lot. I hope you did. Um, let's thank our panelists, and we will be moving on to panel two in just a few minutes. Thank you.